Uh, we were all chilling in uh, high school together, actually. I had a friend named uh, Jerry Douglas who introduced me to Jason. I actually grew up here uh, in Arizona, based in Arizona, um, and it's been hot, of course. Um, grew up skate and like really big into skateboarding, and uh, that you know involved music, you know, punk rock music and everything that kind of got me going. And we kind of formed Authority Zero with this drummer called J.W. J.W. Gordon, with whom we would jam um, during sixth period when he he didn't have any class then. And just get together at Jerry's house, practice, and just mess around in his uh, his house at the time. And like I said, just go skate and do whatever. Just, drink beers, smoke cigarettes, and just hang out and just be kids. And uh, that's mainly why we started playing music, just to give us something to do and have fun. You know, it started off just us chilling, jamming together. So, I mean, we were just friends. We weren't in it to go, like, to the top or anything back then. It was just to play and have a good time and enter entertain everybody, drink beers together. That's where most of our songs and lyrics came from, of course. And uh, we just kind of stuck together since then and went through a plethora of drummers, of course. Like before I was actually in the band, um, which is six years ago now, uh, I was actually in a different band called The New Militia um, with the founding members of Johnny and Timmy and they were actually friends with Authority Zero and that's how I met all those guys. And the funny part is, is I was the drummer for their band and we were like a, like a thrash, like hardcore punk band, like just nothing but chaotic, like all Dead Kennedys influence, just chaos, you know, punk rock band. And we didn't like Authority Zero. So we called him Sorority Queero all the time. <laughs> and then, so it just is complete and total irony that that band is now since passed and I am the drummer for Authority Zero. Oh, uh, Jer Jeremy Wood, we asked to be our bassist because uh, we knew he was, he was like friends with us forever and he kind of helped teach us guitar and whatnot. So who better to, to play the bass than someone that knows what type of guitar you play anyways, you know? Went to Westwood High School and I originally played guitar and went to took guitar class with Bill and was playing guitar for a long time. They needed a bassist and I had been playing bass with another band that I had just left, so joined Authority Zero. We used to play like five shows, six shows a, um, a week in town, which a lot of bands wouldn't normally do because they think they'd be burning themselves out, but we wanted to just, to, you know, for always wanted to play a lot and for two weeks knew we wanted to get out there to as many different places as possible around the city. Um, so sometimes we do like a house party, you know, and then the same night we go and play like the Big Fish Pub or something like that. Well, uh, we got a lot of love from some of the venues here, Big Fish Pub, we did a lot of shows there, we played weekly there, and uh, Jugheads, we played every Friday night there and just scrimped and saved until we could record a little EP, um, you know, saving our little hundred dollar guarantees and stuff, and you know, just playing constantly just because we like to play. It was a good little release. I, would, I was working at an insurance job and I would come to the show still in like dressed all like in professional clothes and stuff. You know, everywhere we could play, parties, anything, you just want to get your name out there, that's what we were doing, you know? And uh, a lot of people said we were saturating the market, but it just kept our name constantly in the paper too, so it kind of worked in our favor. Of course, when I, I mean, when I first got in the band, like we were flyering all the time. Me and Jeremy, I remember we handmade tapes. Like we, we took and dubbed tapes on high speed dub recorders and uh, we would take the, this piece of paper that we'd print out and we'd fold it over and make like tape cassette cases that you slide the tape inside and we'd go hand them out at shows and that was our first like demo. And I didn't even play drums on that thing. That was a demo they already had. In fact, I learned Authority Zero songs off of the demo that I was help making and passing out. So it was pretty crazy, but you know, we really did like all the time. We, we were making those tapes for free because we didn't care. We just wanted to hang out, have a good time. We wanted people to come see us and enjoy the show. So we wanted to go out there and play and have fun and make sure that when people came, they had fun and you know, same shit. We worked really hard, flying as much as we could and just showing up every time we were supposed to. You know, every time that we had set up a gig, we'd show up and that's the best way to get a good rep around town. And it, you know, it start, it start, we built it up from like $2 pint nights over here at Big Fish Pub on Thursdays and then we added another night on Fridays, uh, Punk Rock Fridays at Jug Jugheads. So it's, it seemed like a lot of the two crowds were like melding and it just kind of spread from there. Like people, st the word of mouth kept spreading and we kept sending in uh, demos to Scott Punk, which was a smaller show back then. It was on every Sunday and they had a show called Backyard Bullocks and they would pick, you know, one local band to support a night. And we fortunately were one of the bands that Craven Moorhead dug and it kind of spread to the PDs and everyone in the edge and they gave us a, a big boost and our crowd even went higher once they let us spin some stuff on the radio. So it just kind of was a domino effect, really. That thing, you know, that thing did 
stuff that we never expected it to do. Like, we put that thing together and it was like, I mean, I even did all the artwork for that. Like, all the artwork on the patches and time was, yeah, was done by me. The website was ran by me at the time and, and like, again, it was all for fun. I mean, literally, like, I loved designing. I loved website building and stuff like that, so I did it for pleasure, you know? I'd sit at home for hours on end just drinking beer and coding websites, you know? Thank God Don does it now, because I'd probably go crazy. It was the number one selling uh, CD at the Zia chain in Tempe, and well, the, the little Arizona Zia was number one selling, and I uh, did really well. Kind of helped build our story to get us where we are today. You know, made Lava kind of notice us, and uh, the people down at the edge kind of picked up on One More Minute and spun that a lot for us, which was really good. The One More Minute really ended up being a much bigger than we ever expected it to be, you know. And for God's sakes, we wrote it in Mexico, drunk as piss. <laughs> you never expect a song you write in Mexico to end up being like a single, you know what I mean? But hey, uh, stranger shit has happened, that's for sure. But uh, we did that EP, complete and total, you know, lack of any interest in trying to be this big band or anything. It was just another thing we wanted to do. We wanted to put out this EP. We wanted to have a cool record. We wanted to have a good sounding quality record for once. And it just, that thing just took off out of our hands like a fireball. And we're all out of those. We actually sold out of all of those EPs, so that was cool, you know? I, uh, I cried the day we got signed, and that's the God's honest truth. Um, well, the day that actually, the day that, it, that I realized that the whole thing was kind of happening, uh, I cried. It wasn't actually the day we got signed, because that was like a four-month process. Uh, the day that, that all of it kind of like came to a halt for me, like a halt, I mean, and it just kind of hit a brick wall, was when we were in Vegas, we were meeting with a guy named Avery Lippman, who was a representative of um, Republic, which is a subsidiary of Universal, which is the first label that came to look at us. And he wanted a handshake deal. I mean, we kind of basically wrote a contract out on a napkin and had like a handshake deal with him. And like, you know, like an hour later, like all of us had kind of stopped in this lobby of the hotel that we were hanging out at and just kind of reflected for a moment and I just started crying because it was like everything I ever wanted to, the, to that day had just come true. And I kind of was like a realization was like holy shit like this is really happening right now you know what I mean there's just like no turning back you know. And, uh, and then of course that ended up not going through because other labels came in with interest and so you know the, there just began like a uh, almost like a sale in a sense like you know it was basically a who, uh, who had the best deal that was going to be the most benefit towards the band? How can we get the most benefit out of a record label? You know, who's going to give us more, um, more creative ability, more you know, control over our website, merchandise, all that kinds of stuff? It was, it's cool, man. It's been, it's been fun. It's been nothing but fun this entire time. And I mean, that's why we kept on doing it. And otherwise, I think we'd probably all have just like nine to fivers and just you know, be, deli be delivering pizza still. And about a month into touring, uh, it was just, it was unbelievable. We went out with H2O, uh, and Slightly Stupid actually was the very first tour we ever did, which was just, that was the most phenomenal experience of my life. Like, I have never been out of sight of Arizona, you know, on my own or anything, other than being with my parents or whatever, but never like literally on my own. So it was like to go out and tour for a week with six of my best friends and you you got the world at your fingertips, you know, what are you gonna do? Dream come true, you know, I mean, it's like, these are a lot of the bands, like I said, that we grew up listening to and went and saw the shows and like, you know, stick out as the fondest memories in your head a lot of times and what you got into music for a lot of times. And so it's really cool to, you know, be able to talk to them and, you know, have them on a more personal level, I guess. And like, almost as peers, I guess, you know. H2O was right after that. We got to venture even farther east. And that was the first time we'd I'd gotten to like Ohio and. Michigan and all those places and that was just crazy and then it just got progressively better. Suddenly I found myself sitting in the same room as Fat Mike talking about bass guitars, you know, who would who would have ever thunk that at all? Like I've grown up, I mean Punk and Drubbuck is like a staple in my life, dude. I can't go two days without hearing that record, you know what I mean? And yet I could call the guy right now if I wanted to, it's just... It just kind of like changes things completely, like you know, you look up these bands like as almost idolistic and then it's like it's just cool like to have that transfer into like you know just being able to hang out with them and like play you know play with them and stuff like that yeah i don't know like that, that i'm still starstruck with all of this like none of it has extremely settled in yet you know it took me and bill like we both had said it took us like four or five days of hanging out with no effects and then suddenly we kind of stopped and went holy shit, we're hanging out with no effects right now, <laughs> like, oh my god, you know, and then you're starstruck all over again, like, you just, you know, Pennywise was the same way. Turned out to be the nicest guys in the world, you know, like, 
talk to Fletcher a whole bunch, talk to Jim a whole bunch, but still every day I saw him, it was like, oh my God, that's Pennywise. We've covered coast to coast, hit all, all but two states, really. You know, we, we went on a, just about a year and a half solid. Um, it was some 41, the Pungarama tour. It's really cool to get to see all the different places in the country and stuff, you know, seeing all the different cities. It's been a real fun experience. So touring's great, you just get to see how your market expands and how the kids just keep coming back and, and I don't like to refer to it as a market, but you know, that, you know, I get kind of that ground into me from talking business with the label and whatnot, but you know, you just see how your, your fan base just expands, you know, it's great to see, uh, you know, we'll go to Boise, we went to Boise and there's like 30 people and now when we go back there, you know, you sell a place up that holds 900, so you get to see your progression as it goes, that's what's cool about that. The last record was a collaboration of music that Authority Zero had written years upon years ago before I was in the band. Only a few songs on that record did I have a hand in and actually writing. And this record was 100% us entirely writing together as a foursome after playing with each other on the road for a year and a half, you know. So I think 
we came out of this record, you know, 10 times stronger and 10 times more ready to, to tackle the world. We've been home for like seven months now recording uh, the new album, and uh, that was a really cool experience. We really got to meet and make good friends with Ryan Green, and uh, same with Miguel. The recording process, working with Ryan Green, again, who is uh, one of the biggest producers in the punk rock kingdom because he did just about every NoFX record that's on the planet. Um, from me, from my perspective, and I had a little different than everybody else because Ryan Green is one of the best drummers I've ever met. So let alone do I got to work with this guy who's created some of the best records I have in my collection, but I got to great work with this guy who I know is going to be twice as hard on me because he could outplay me any day. And if I fucked it up and I couldn't do it right, he could, do all, he could go out there and do it himself. You know what I mean? So the pressure was really on and he was great he was more of a teacher than he was a producer if i didn't understand something the coolest part was he would walk out into the studio i would stand up he would sit down with my drumsticks and he would sit there and do god do 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 you know and exactly explain it this is exactly what you're doing and this is what you're doing wrong and so i came out you know three four weeks later it was like three and a half weeks i think and i i have seriously like five times better drummer than i was before uh, to me at least, because I've grown, I feel like I've grown and I've made it better, you know? It actually was a fresh perspective while writing, you know, having a, having a couple producers kind of put their two cents in it. It was just a lot of concepts that we came up with on the road that, you know, we didn't have eight years to do this time. We we just would play them and sound checks and whatnot, and, and then, uh, you know, we just brought them to the producer and they arranged them pretty well for us. And then, you know, with Miguel, it was just amazing to work with somebody that's just so, like, in tune with like the reggae sounds and, and just kind of like the laid back like Long Beach dub and really get into like groove. Like instead of being so like powerful and really trying to get in there and make hard crazy songs, it was like sit back and chill and like just groove a song out. And he was the same way. I mean, he, he would come in and be like, no, he's like, you gotta lay into it. You know, I didn't get it, but after a while, it was like you kind of start to get into his little mode and then, you know, so recording process for me was unbelievable because I was just like the best of both worlds. I got to learn how to groove really, really well and learn how to, you know, get even more technical than I, you know, wanted to be in the past. So the things that both of them taught me have been making me progress even more on a day-to-day -day basis because I've been picking up new things by practicing the things that they showed me. So now the record's out. Um, I'm still not ready for it. Uh, I don't know why. But I'm just not, like for some reason it hasn't hit me yet that the record is released. The last time when we released, uh, there were a lot of people that took interest in it, about 1,200 in the first week. But this week I think we're on track to sell 7,500. So that shows you kind of how touring augmented the amount of people that actually went out and bought it right off the bat. So yeah, I think that it's going to be a lot bigger this time because we already have a fan base established in tons of places, you know? So we're just going to go back and kick some ass for like, you know, two more years probably supporting this album like we did the last. And I, I, I hope we can go platinum with it, but you know, that's just, every band wants to do that. So we're seeing, we're seeing what we can do. Uh, I'm stoked, man. We, this, this second one we've been pushing back for at least a couple months. You know, we had, we recorded it in about two and a half months and uh, it's finally coming out now. So I mean, we're just... We're just stoked that, you know, hopefully the kids that had the last album will get a chance to, you know, let's go out there and grab this one. And, and we'd like to get out of the band that we're in. We've been in <laughs> for about four years. Yeah, I, you know, I love the guys, but I don't like waking up to their breath in my face. <laughs> Especially Jeremy's. I don't know, I had to say somebody. I always blame Jeremy, I'm sorry, man. I'm having fun still, and that's what I think really is the, the biggest thing. So, uh, enjoy it, and just hopefully the album does good, and we can, you know, tour and do this for a long time. It's, it feels it feels good to like see you, you know, after 10 years, like see you know, people coming around and like actually enjoying what we're doing with us, you know. I I've always since day one I've said I wanted to take it as far as it'll go. I, you know, all the all the kids I grew up with were always the hardcore punkers. Fuck MTV. Fuck this. Fuck that. And I'm like, you know, part of my language, but. Um, I'm just, you know, I don't care. Like, this is my career. If, you know, it's gonna go to MTV and it's gonna become as big as the Backstreet Boys, then so be it. You know what, I'm still playing the music that I love. I'm still spreading the sound that I love to play and I love to write to the rest of the world. And the more people that get to hear it, the happier I'm gonna be. Because, you know, we need to break boundaries. We need to, to you know, Bill said it too, like, we need to bust walls down that, of kids that, you know, I only listen to punk rock, I only listen to metal, I only listen to alternative. You know, it's like, you know what, there's some great hip hop out there. <laughs> you know, 50 Cent may not be your thing, but have you ever listened to The Roots, you know? And those are, com those are two totally different world spectrums in hip hop. Be 
you know, most kids don't know that. You know, it's just like punk rock. You know, you've got you've got the total pop punk styles of the old Green Day shit. Then you can break it all the way down to the Misfits, and you know, it's like you're looking at night and day there. You know, but that's just the way all, all of it is. And I think the the bigger that we can take this, and the more worldwide we can get it, the better. And I'm just I'm just holding on for the ride. I want to take it as far as it'll possibly go. I don't care. <laughs> the more people that can hear it, the better, the happier I'm going to be and the you know, more fulfilled I'll feel. Plus, I really want to go to Europe. Start up a band, do it with your friends, because I mean that's probably going to cause the most longevity. You know, you never, yeah. That way, you, you almost, you know, you're doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it to have fun with your friends. You're doing it, you know, to play music. It's, you know, it's not for a, a different, you know, marketing, whatever. You know, it's like it's just make sure you're you're, you're with people you can actually work with and that are open-minded and, uh, you know, make sure you have fun with it. Because the minute you stop having fun, is the minute it's going to totally fall to shit. 
you know, and it's just going to end up being a job or whatever for you. So. And do it because you like to do it, not because you want to get signed. Um, that was one of our keys. We never, we never shopped. We never looked. Um, we just did it because we liked to play. It was our little release. And uh, one day, finally, you know, they came to us. You know, get a website, of course. You know, website's a big thing. It's like people aren't even buying albums anymore. You know, you want to make sure that everybody's, you know, seeing your name on the Internet because that's where everybody goes now. And just promote yourself as much as possible and play out as much as you can. You just have to be persistent. You have to make sure you're flyering and you got to make sure the people that are working for you are doing the right stuff. You got to get a website. Um, you got to keep hounding the radio stations, even though they say they don't like it. But at least they know they don't like you. Like the name, your name. At least their na your name's sticking in their head. You just got to keep at people and uh, diversify where you play. Don't keep playing one place constantly. Like you may want to do that like a specific night, but you want to make sure that you get into a lot of venues because uh, the more places in the new times your name pops up, the better chance you got of getting noticed. Plus, you'll get uh, a bigger demographic that watches you. Make everybody know your name. I mean, like a fungus, make them know your name. I, flyers, CDs, CD flyers, that's even better. Uh, anything you can do, posters, even if it's just a random poster that just says your name on it, and you put it on a wall, who cares? If they see it all the time, it'll get stuck in their head. When you start announcing shows, people will start seeing that and saying, oh yeah, I heard about this band, oh yeah, I saw this there, this there, and this and there, you know? They might show up, so you may get one or two more people out of it. Yeah, I love the internet. We um, actually put up our email on the website, on authorityzero.com. You can hit us up at band at authorityzero.com or any of our names, like Bill, Jim, Jason, or Jeremy at authorityzero.com. Uh, we keep in contact with our fans personally, so you know that helps us out a lot and helps them out uh, to answer questions and whatnot. Um, you can hit us up on MySpace. That's a great place to kind of communicate. I was on Friendster for a while, but that server is shit, so I don't go there anymore. <laughs> Sorry, Friendster. Um, you know what, UBL, Ultimate Band List, is a good place to check bands out. Uh, MP3.com, you can check out a lot of local bands and get their music distributed that way. And I don't know, there's a million places. Just go to a search engine, you'll find anything you need on that. You're going to have people that will tell you constantly, you're not going to do this, get a different, you know, get a job that's going to support you for the rest of your life. And, you know, say I'm not saying that's bad, you know, but you got to take risks. You, you, allegedly, you only live life once, so uh, if this is the only life you're going to live, then, then why just conform, you know? Why just get the normal job and be the 9 to 5 person for the rest of your life? Why not take that risk? You, you're only going to piss yourself off more later on if you don't know what actually would have happened. Stage show is everything. A band can have the best CD in the world, and I could name quite a few that I absolutely love, and then I go to see them and I'm just so disappointed. You know, it's like the live show's everything. You buy their disc and you're pumped to listen to it and you want to go see them live and you want to get up there and just get all crazy and listen to it and and then they just kind of stand there and you're like, okay, this sucks. Like, this is boring. This is what I hear in my car, you know what I mean? Like, I could get stoked, but I want to see you guys move around. I want to see your interaction. I'm online 24 hours a day. I, you know, when, when I first got a, a sum of money that was larger than a $240 paycheck a week, I spent every bit of it on a laptop you know what I mean like I'm such a computer freak so the internet has been my best friend since the days of you know 14.4 and you know like the surfing the internet back then was just horrible <laughs> it was the coolest thing and it was fast as hell but uh, I'm knocking over beer that's not good party foul don't drink, don't drink like me kids um, yeah, I, there's so many websites out there, uh, and, and I'm just starting to tap into a lot of them with Authority Zero. I mean, we've gotten into MySpace, we've gotten into PureVolume.com. There's so many websites out there that are completely free. They don't cost you a dime. All you gotta have is an email address. And shoot, get a second email address that you can consider a bunk email address and sign up for every freaking last one of them you can sign up for. If they're free, hit them up. That's just, it's advertising. You're, you're not spending any money on it, you know? And advertising is where you're gonna spend a lot of money. Make sure you support your local scene. Make sure you go out to other people's shows. If you get a chance, support them. And uh, you know, talk to them, talk to everybody at the shows, talk to the bands, and uh, try and build the community. You know, try and really, because the minute you talk, you know, the minute you talk and support these bands, is the minute they're gonna come back and support you. And it's just gonna be a, a big team effort. So man, just support your local scene. You gotta check out Redfield.com. I gotta hook my homies up. Uh, shit. Well, thanks to Miguel for helping us out this last album. Ryan Green kicked the ass, so I don't really have much to say. That's about it, I guess. Thank you to every last person that's ever been 
behind this engine, every one of you. I, I know there's a million of you out, and if I start naming, I'm going to forget, and you're all going to beat me with a wooden spoon, but every single person, and you know who you are, if you stepped behind this project in any way, I can't thank you enough, because my dreams have come true, and I'm sitting here today doing a DVD because of it. Head to LA, so you know we had so many influences because of that, and we're about to get hit by a car, I think. Yep. <laughs> hopefully, they, hopefully they go around us, or maybe Let's maybe this will be us. maybe this will be our faces of death. My name is Bart Burks. How long have you been doing this mixing thing? Um, since the beginning. I'm not even sure how many years it's been now, but since the very beginning. Mother. All right, that's good. Fuck. Just tell when I first started, it, a lot of the fans hated me, and now they like me. It's kind of fun. It's fun, they, you know, they want to shake my hand and stuff. Oh, they rock, man! <laughs> uh, Brent, Ash. And what did you do again? I did the album artwork. Awesome, so what do you think about Authority Zero, man? Tell me uh, I think they're great, man. I think they're gonna, this is going to be the big album for them. They're going to blow up, and uh, everyone's going to know who they are. Authority Zero kicks ass! I saw you guys four years ago in Matt Martinez's living room, and I loved it ever since! Yes! Keep supporting Authority Zero and, and the, the local bands around here. They really put on a good show.